Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Ryan North presenting his new book, How to Take Over the World, joined in conversation by Randall Monroe. Thank you for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's virtual event series continues this spring, bringing authors and their work to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen, or you can also disable captions there if you prefer not to see them. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase how to take over the world on harvard.com. Your purchases truly make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and purchasing books from Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings over these past couple of years, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Ryan North is a New York Times bestselling author of several previous titles, including How to Invent Everything, Romeo and or Juliet, and To Be or Not to Be. He's also the creator of Dinosaur Comics and the Eisner award-winning writer of Adventure Time, Jughead, and the unbeatable Squirrel Girl for Marvel Comics. Joining him on our digital stage this evening is Randall Monroe, creator of the beloved webcomic XKCD and author of several best-selling books, including What If and, forthcoming in September, What If 2. They'll be discussing Ryan's new book, How to Take Over the World, Practical Schemes and Scientific Solutions for the Aspiring Supervillain. It's a very important reference for all of us. Esquire calls it exuberant, optimistic, and just plain fun, and book page writes, how to take over the world lays out a hilarious, but totally factual blueprint for all the ways aspiring supervillains could seize power, control minds and dominate the earth. It's a little dangerous, but all in good fun. So long as Pinky and the brain don't catch wind of it. We're so pleased to be hosting this event tonight. The digital podium is yours, Ryan and Randall. Hello. Hey. Hi, Randy. Hey, Ryan. Um, How's it going? It's pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me in public. <laughs> hey, no, thanks for thanks for inviting me to, to uh, talk about your fantastic book and congratulations on the launch. Thank you. And also thanks, Serena and the Harvard Bookstore for yes. hosting us. Um, and also thank you for, uh, before we get to the book, for my entire career. Um, I feel Interesting. like we haven't, we haven't really talked about this. No, no, but really, when I when I started out doing comics, uh, I felt like I shouldn't call them comics. Like I was like, I'm not really do I'm drawing stuff, but it's stick figures. It's not really comics, right? Um, and and I and people were always really nice to me, but I sort of felt insecure, out of place. Like like they were thinking like, you know, yeah, you're but you're just drawing stick figures, right? But I really liked your comic, and so I always felt reassured because I was like. <laughs> He draws even less than me, and I lowered and the bar really enough cool. that you felt comfortable. <laughs> yeah, and and no, and and it was cool because it was like, oh, this is a kind of thing you can do, and mm -hmm. and and then I started doing it, and uh, it has been a lot of fun. I did not know that. Um, thank you. That that's really sweet. And yeah, it really makes me happy. Um, but I'm really I'm a huge fan of your book. I'm uh, I'm a shameless compulsive book slip cover remover. <laughs> I don't know why I, I just do it. I find it always find it easier to hold. Um, and I can't help but notice from some of the sort of subtle hints in this book, like mm. the cover and every page inside it, that you seem to maybe sympathize with supervillains just a little bit. Um, but I feel like I, I know you reasonably well. It doesn't seem like you sympathize with <clears throat> like just bad people. And yeah. So like, 
What's the di- what makes a supervillain different? Um, I feel like I always go to the distinction in my head between um, charismatic super crime and pedestrian boring crimes. So the difference between like robbing a bank is boring and pedestrian. Stealing a bank, you know, now we're talking. Now we're getting the world of like super crime and super crime is something that is unprecedented and something that's fun and something that is uh the thing the way to find the book is something that seems like it should be impossible but isn't and that that really got me going the idea of uh super villains as people who work outside the established systems to try to bring about a better world is a description that you know also applies to superheroes and everyone likes superheroes and villains normally you, the best villains you can see where they're coming from, right? You go, well, you know, I don't approve of his methods, but he is trying to make everyone live forever. And I got to say that has some upsides I can see. So there's there's fun, I think, in, in empathizing with the villains and a lot of really interesting things to unpack when you start taking their, their super schemes super seriously. And I think there's a lot of room between like legitimately bad person and cool villain doing crazy things and i want to i wanted to explore that space yeah i'm i I was sort of surprised to see how much like to see that uh you talked about that definition um that they're trying to bring about a better world Mm -hmm. and that really so so what is the distinction between a supervillain and a superhero then because it seems like a superhero is also trying to do that they're just on the other side from the supervillain yeah it's a popularity contest i think okay. Okay, <laughs> i think so like it's... dr doom sees himself as a hero and you know his name is not his fault he was born into the doom family really <laughs> yeah yeah it's also so... dr doom doesn't have a actual phd he, it's he doesn't hasn't earned his doctorate <laughs> there's a lot of things to unpack when we talk about Dr. Doom. Um, but yeah, I think the best villains see themselves as the heroes of the story. And the difference there is that a hero would not, you know, dig a hole to the earth's core to hold all the gold there hostage, and a villain would, but they both see at the end of this some way that the world would be better from it. I think that's the that's that's what I sort of call enlightened supervillainy. <laughs> well, so it's it's fun. Um, you know, like, like you, I have a lot of fun taking these like really outlandish schemes and, um, seeing if there are ways to make it work. Mm-hmm. The, but the best thing is when you take a really outlandish scheme and discover that someone's already done it. <laughs> um, because you have the section on supervillains secret bases mm-hmm. and you talk about how there are actually some of these bases lying around, you know, that, that one could take. Um, yeah. So my first my first question is up in Canada. Have you been to I think it's the Defen Bunker, they call it, in Carp, There's, Ontario. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've I've always been sort of curious. They're like, oh yeah, we've dug these really big holes in Canada, and you can hide there in a nuclear war. I I'm amazed that that made because they're they're famous in Canada. I'm surprised Americans know about the Defen Bunker. Well, I do spend a lot of time reading about weird secret bases and stuff. Um, you know, you know, uh, my favorite of those weird secret base things is, do you know that Amherst College owns a nuclear bunker? I did not, and I want to hear more. So it's not just a bomb shelter in the basement kind of thing. Um, In uh, uh, sometime in the early Cold War, uh, I think it was the Air Force built one of those mountain command centers in Western Massachusetts uh, uh, on the opposite side of a mountain range from an Air Force base. And it was designed to be the bunker that would survive the nuclear war. And it's got the big command and control room and all the yeah, stuff yeah. in there. And then the Cold War ended and this space was sitting around. And they finally put it on the market and Amherst College bought it. Love and it. they are currently using it to store like archival materials and, you know, antique furniture and stuff. There's a real appeal to having a bunker. I feel like it's it's almost universal, this idea of like, it's the unexamined fantasy, right? Like I'll have a place that will survive anything and then I can go there in the event of catastrophe. And you always sort of stop thinking there and you don't think of until after that where you're like, okay, so I'll be surrounded by hurt and starving people who are begging for my help <laughs> and the living will envy the dead. And that sort of like horrible post-apocalyptic stuff isn't the fun part. The fun part is I'm going to have a base and it's going to have documents and antique furniture and hopefully some food. <laughs> 
Have you, have you thought about, I mean, now and then you see the missile silos go around on like real estate sites. Have you thought about it? I've priced, I've got to the point of pricing them out and been like, ah, I can't justify it. And also I don't have that kind of money. So two reasons not to do it. But I will tell you that uh, during pandemics, so a lot of time at this cottage in the woods. And uh, sometimes I want to do a video call and so I'll drive into town. And I found this spot. It's at the intersection of four roads surrounded by farmer's fields where I get incredible internet speeds. There's no reason for it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure one day those fields will just open up to reveal some sort of missile silo underneath because there's no reason for this wilderness area to have better internet than Toronto. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll plan an expedition to try to figure yeah. that one out. Yeah, you'll have to come yeah. see, I'll show you. Um, so. So skipping ahead, I, I when I first opened your book, I flipped straight to the cloning dinosaurs chapter. Sure. Um, but I also noticed, so you called you called the movie Jurassic Park, frankly alarmist. <laughs> so so do you think scientists spent too much time thinking about whether or not they should and forgot to just think like, but can we? Uh, the reason I described Jurassic Park as frankly alarmist is because they have done what, three, four, five movies in this franchise. And in every single one of them, it goes poorly and dinosaurs escape. And, you know, I feel like in reality, dinosaurs escape once and then you repair the way they escape and they don't escape the same way. And on your fourth or fifth try, I think, I mean, my ideal version of a Jurassic Park movie, which I was hoping Jurassic World would do, would be we get to go and see the park for an hour and a half <laughs> and see the dinosaurs and look at the rides and see the concessions. And it's just a really amazing park full of dinosaurs. Like that's the experience I want. And so that was the experience I was trying to push people towards in the book of just like, we have all these movies that says that say it'll go poorly, but what if it didn't? What if we, you know, thought about, because so much of the book is thinking about logistics and, and what you actually need to make this happen. And I feel like with the right people in charge, I will go on record and say Jurassic Park could work, could make sense. Yeah, I, I, I always, I was always so annoyed. Like I, I read all these books, you know, when it came out, and Ian Malcolm is all, my chaos theory models prove these dinosaurs will escape, and and I was always like, first of all, I, I read a bunch about chaos theory, and I don't see anything about dinosaurs. <laughs> um, but also, Just that like, chapter. what what do those models say about regular zoos? Like animals escape once in a while, but like they are able to open without like dozens of guests getting eaten immediately. Yeah. I mean, I guess the stakes are higher with dinosaurs, but you know, there's venomous snakes in zoos. There's lions and tigers and lots of animals that are credible human predators. Yeah. You know what? Jurassic Park is a lie. It'd be fine. <laughs> All right. You've convinced me. <laughs> Jurassic Park is frankly alarmist. Frankly alarmist. Um, so... Okay, so so later question. Are you planning to die? For context, for those who haven't read the book, there is a chapter on immortality. <laughs> yeah, so so but this is how Randy opens most conversations, I find. <laughs> let's let's skip the small talk. Are you planning to die? Um I think I am. Okay. <laughs> I feel well, like part of the part of the talking in this book about immortality was um you know, actually thinking hard about, is this a good idea? And I've always been deeply suspicious of, I've read a bunch of stories all written by mortal people about how immortality is not that great and death is what gives life meaning and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this sounds like something a mortal would write. <laughs> I don't think an immortal person would be saying how great death is. So I was initially very skeptical of immortality being bad, but the more you 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 poke at it and you, you sort of tease it apart, the more you find but there are a lot of bad things that come with people not dying. There's the uh, lack of end of life charity from billionaires, which, you know, isn't great, but it's something it, it, you, you lose the thing of like, you can't take it with you if, if you never have to die. And it also, if there's some sort of medical procedure that, that helps you reach this immortal stage, then medical procedures cost money. And now you have a group of, immortal rich people and poor people who live and die. And that seems cartoonishly horrible. So I came to the conclusion uh, in the book that 
and this is sort of the definition of enlightened supervillainy, that immortality is bad in general, but if only you were to become immortal, maybe there's some upsides there. You get the benefits with none of the downsides. So this is this is the whole supervillain thing where you're like, I cannot give you immortality, only I must have it. And you think, oh, it's great. And the person says, no, 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 I hear I've done all this research and philosophical thinking about why only I should become immortal. It's very persuasive if you'll just read it. So all this to say, I am intending to die, but there are a lot of people, a lot of rich people who uh, can't answer yes to that and are working very hard to figure out mind uploading or, or stem cell transplants or all sorts of ways to desperately cheat death within the space of one human lifetime so they, they don't have to die. Um, I liked the, the I've, I've appreciated your sort of, um, that you enjoy Wikipedia as much as me, <laughs> just as an institution sort of. Yeah. I, I was surprised to see that as a suggestion for how to become immortal. Is yeah. Edit Wikipedia. Yeah, it's um, so one of the later chapters in the book is, let's say you you pulled off all this heist in the book, all the schemes, and you're you're you've taken the world, everything's great. The last thing that can threaten you is to one day be forgotten, and so you need to ensure that stories of your brilliance can survive ten years, one year, ten years, a hundred years, a thousand years, uh, all the way to the heat death of the universe. <laughs> and for one year, I was saying, you know, Wikipedia is a great way to do this because. There is vandalism that I did in Wikipedia in 2003 that is still there in their archives. I double checked, uh, it was great. I'll tell you the vandalism. It was on uh, for an Alenic bond, which is a type of chemical bond. I was uh, dating a woman named Aline and I wrote on the page that Aline is also a cute lady. <laughs> it was reverted, but it's still there if you know where to look. So this information has been backed up across Wikimedia, Wikipedia servers around the world. And if you're just trying to store information for a year, um, that vandalism is a super viable way to do it. And I felt bad because this is not my first time uh, vandalizing Wikipedia in public. And I love Wikipedia, they do great work. But um, I did in, I think 2006, uh, suggest that instead of, vandalize, instead of people vandalizing Wikipedia, which is bad, it induces errors and mistakes in the encyclopedia, uh, we should all just vandalize one article and it should be the chickens article <laughs> and this was at the, the early days of dinosaur comics where i didn't realize great power comes great responsibility mm -hmm. and this sent a ton of vandals towards the chicken article and uh first they locked it and then they invented semi-protection in an unrelated thing and the chickens article is still semi-protected to this day and i do feel bad about that because that's over <laughs> it's like 20 years almost of uh chicken vandalism but i think it could work <laughs> I, i'm trying to think i feel like i i think i've only maybe vandalized wikipedia once i've definitely written things really that caused wikipedia to get vandalized <laughs> in a direct way that i do not take responsibility for yes there was no, no article... jury could convict you yeah exactly there there was um there was an article on a construction project that was one of those things where there's an active volcano and they were trying to deal with the, the lava flow. And, and they talked about how they sent bulldozers driving across the lava with metal treads to you know uh, uh, lay equipment out there to try to protect this town. Right. And then somewhere in there, they had the line like, doing construction work atop a moving active lava flow was dangerous. And so they had to blah, blah, blah. And so on the doing construction work over a lava flow is dangerous. I added a citation needed. Perfect. <laughs> um, I feel like I feel like that kind of vandalism. It's I I I I know it's wrong in, but it's, but it's so it, cheeky. I, I mean, I, I think Chris has said this publicly, so I'm not outing him. Uh, Chris Hastings, of Doctor McNinja fame, his favorite Wikipedia vandalism was to go to a random paragraph in a random article and just add the phrase, believe it or not, in front of a sentence. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the things where you're like, this could have been how this was originally written and, you know, I wouldn't be sure. Yeah. Although I, I personally, I think um, Wikipedia talk pages are where the real- Oh, that's, uh, that's the good stuff. <laughs> good stuff is. Like, I mean, my, I think one of my favorites is like the, just the talk page on the article on humans. Where they had I to haven't decide, seen it. Like, first of all, there's just everything you can imagine 
goes in there because everyone has an opinion about people uh and there's a lot of those many of them are gonna be started about humans um, god but like the debate over what picture should be at the top interesting has like spanned like 40 different talk pages like who do we use to illustrate humans <laughs> if you want it to be a clear example of a human um i gather no consensus has been reached they're, they have in like 2011. They were like, here's a picture. It's a couple. They're standing in a field. They they look like normal humans. That'll do. And they've like settled on that after like a uh, uh, furious debate. I'm sure every couple of years someone wanders in and says, hey, we should yeah. change this picture. And it's like, no. <laughs> you know, my there's a the the people wandering in every couple of years. Um, one of my one of the ones I check in on now and then is the moon article mm -hmm. because people will go and try to add did you know that the moon or but known by its scientific name luna or like officially named luna right um <clears throat> because it sounds latin like it sounds like an official name but it's actually just a thing robert heinlein made up or at least popularized right like that's not a science thing but people are so sure of it that they go and add that and then someone removes it. it and then they argue over it in the talk page that's great that's that's like the purest form of Wikipedia is the the honest. I want to help out, and I don't know what I don't know. I'm just gonna <laughs> see what happens. I love it. It's great. It's, yeah. it's. I think that is the most human of all. That <laughs> we can have a screenshot of that at the top of the human. <laughs> well, so I I um, I asked a couple of friends uh, uh, what they would ask about super villainy. Um, Interesting. And and. There was a, a, a one of them, a, my friend Ruben. He, he said, "So okay, taking over the world seems like it should be millions of times harder than taking over my apartment building, for example." Right. But taking over my apartment building already sounds really hard. <laughs> Is there something that makes it easier to go big? Um, there is actually. I think the the advantage that most of the schemes in the book have is that since they are so big, uh, they're unprecedented. No one has done them before. And so no one expects for them to happen, right? It's like the first person to break out of jail by having an, uh, I almost said acquaintance and, and associate fly over with a helicopter and a rope ladder. The first person who did that blew their minds. Like, this is great. We have a whole new crime to do here. And the, the people holding people in jail have to figure out how to prevent that. And there's a, there's a call and response. And once you're used to it, you're used to it. And we figured out, I think humans know a lot of ways to take over apartment buildings. But when you're talking about like, what if we want to control the weather? Or what if we want to blow up the internet? Uh, these things haven't been done. And so the, the countermeasures aren't necessarily there at all. So you have the advantage of all the, all the schemes have the, advantage of having never been tried before. <laughs> um, that, is, that is a really good point. And, and that's a good point about helicopters. Um, if you're looking for a good, uh, a good Wikipedia article, I believe <laughs> list of helicopter prison escapes. I've read that article. I know. Yes. <laughs> so and it's like, now it's a whole new category where it's something that happens so often that you can get a Wikipedia, a list of all of the times someone's pulled it off. I love when you find a list when you're not expecting a list. Uh, Wikipedia had a list, still has a list of sandwiches. And I said, I'm going to make every sandwich on the list of sandwich. This will be my, my goal for the year. And I made a toast sandwich, which is a piece of toast between two pieces of bread. And uh, took a photo, uploaded to the page. It's still, I'm still the official photographer of toast sandwiches on Wikipedia. <laughs> and I stopped. So I was like, you know what? I feel like it's either all uphill from the toast sandwich or all downhill from the toast sandwich. But either way, I'm, I'm happy to stop with this this almost de deconstructed idea of what a sandwich is. I think it's all uphill from the toast sandwich. I can't imagine that it's... It's interesting. There's like, okay, so there's subtle... Because bread and toast taste different and they have a different texture. And so it's almost like art because it forces you to notice shades of taste and meaning that you haven't detected before when eating a sandwich. I know that sounds like a line, but it, it was really... Uh, astonishingly edible and not what I was expecting. I did not expect, first you convinced me on <laughs> Jurassic Park and now I'm convinced about this too. I'm gonna try, okay. Yeah. It's easy to make. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as I understand it, the recipe is not too complicated. Um, is it, 
Huh. Um, so, so another another question was, um, so like if, if an aspiring supervillain comes to you, like right out of college, if uh, right. I'm not sure what you made. Is there a major? What wait, <laughs> Dr. Doom? So wait, tell me, clarify this. Dr. <laughs> Doom's uh, uh, does not have a PhD. No, he went, he did higher education. I think he was pursuing a PhD. He okay. got into a battle with the hated Reed Richards. And at some point, uh, there an accident happens. He blames Richard for it. And he sort of half drops out, half gets kicked out of college. And then wants to destroy Reed Richards, who becomes Mr. Fantastic. Oh. So, 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 well, is that your advice? So what, what do you take from that? What, what should, like, what um, should you study? In like, school well, to... like, what should you study? Or say you've just gotten your degree, you know, or you've just, uh, uh, you're fresh into the supervillain market. Mm -hmm. Like, what, uh, what tips do you have? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I feel there's two parts of it, right? There's a practical part of, you need to know, the edges of science and technology and the very, the bleeding edge of what's possible. And the other half is sort of the more fun half of, you need a attractive and charismatic costume. You need to, to look the part because, you know, super villainy, the, the super part is there. You have to be fabulous. Uh, my book mostly focuses on the science and technology part of it. Uh, there's not a lot of like, what color cape should coordinate with your metal mask. But I feel like if I was enough, like fresh out of school, I would uh, read a lot of research papers uh, and then I would read a lot of fashion magazines. And I think you could combine those two in a way that's not done by most people. Fascinating. <laughs> that is a really good pair of tips. Um, so, so there was a paper that came out just a few days ago um, where there were, there are drug researchers who are trying to discover yes. medicines. Yes, and um, okay, so you may have run into this. Yep, yep. Yeah, and, and so what the drug researchers were doing um, was like, like many people, they're all convinced that AI will find drugs for everything. And so far, it, you know, it's helping a little, but it's not really finding yep. drugs yet. Underperforming. Yeah, but, but you know, give it time. But they can at least, they're, they're trying to get them to do things like toxicity screens, because one of the hardest things about inventing drugs is that you have a drug that looks like it does what you want, and then you put it in people and they die. They you die. Know? And you're like, <laughs> oh, that didn't. And it's weird how often that happens. Like drugs fail yep. on basic safety trials, even when you think that uh, you've got them, you've got a good one. Um, and so they had machine learning that would try to optimize and, and find versions of a compound that would be uh, non-toxic and try to pick out, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of the toxic ones. So at some point fairly recently, one of the teams of researchers realized we can run this algorithm in reverse. Um, we, we can just say, instead of trying to minimize toxicity, maximize toxicity. We flip the good bit to evil. Yeah, and then, and they press the button and it immediately like invented VX and Saren. Within like six hours, I think, yeah, right? like it's super quick. Yeah, it was, and, and then a whole bunch of other ones were like, hey, this is worse than the current best nerve gas we have. Um, and they were like, this is pretty alarming. And also, and I really liked it's one of those papers where they said like, we're not great at this. Like we're not a big <laughs> fancy research institution. There's a lot of people who can run this same software. Yeah. Um, which I think might be the only time I've ever seen a research paper sort of negging itself. <laughs> They're like, well, well we really suck at research and even we have figured out how to do this. So that should be pretty scary. Exactly. Um, that would, that's sort of two things. The first is that uh, that's kind of my defense. When I, when I first announced the book, a friend of mine contacted me privately and was like, Ryan, this book is really dangerous. You shouldn't be putting this out into the world. And my response was like, look, I write comic books for Marvel and DC. And if I can come up with these plots, I guarantee other people can too. So secrecy is not the, the answer here. And also you need $56 billion to pull them off. And also if you can, there's probably, if your goal is really world domination um, in the real world, you probably don't need any of my plots. You probably can just bribe politicians, <laughs> that sort of thing. But the second thing I was, I read that and I was like, you know, I remember being in, in grad school and I was, I was casting around for a thesis. And at one point I thought, you know, I'm, I'm studying computational linguistics. It would be very easy to, take a semantic network and 
tape that into a collection of synonyms and use that to take a reasonable document and automatically add puns to it. So if we're talking about bikes, instead of saying, uh, it, that's a nice bike, he said, it could change it to, that's a nice bike, he spoke, because spokes are related to bikes and also synonyms said. So you could programmatically add a bunch of really terrible, obvious puns to any document. And I thought, I didn't do it because I felt like this is too easy, this is an afternoon, this isn't a thesis. But also I didn't do it because you could run that in reverse and then remove terrible puns. I have a web browser filter that removes all puns from documents. And I was like, I don't want that out in the world. <laughs> so the first thing I thought of was what if you ran this in full reverse and then decided not to do it. So I was a little disappointed that these researchers were like, we got to the point of trying to invent new medicines. And we thought, hey, what if we turn it on backwards and within six hours invented, reinvented these horrible uh, nerve gases and we were shocked that we could do this. And I felt like kind of should have seen that sooner. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm glad they published a paper because we're all talking about it, but like, really you didn't foresee that until it was in your lap? On the other hand, like given the, given how much trouble that whole field of, of drug research has been running into, maybe they were also like, let's be honest, this probably won't work because it doesn't work when we run it forward either. <laughs> yeah, they get a bunch of uh, disappointingly neutral toxins yeah like oh like all right we're going to invent the most toxic substance ever and you run it and it turns for six hours and it's like we've invented the toast sandwich <laughs> i was gonna say like salt water drink yeah, too salt. much well like not see what happens brine <laughs> like a, it's a little salty yeah yeah just I a like, little unpleasant yeah I, I i i like finding the mildest version of something where it's like this is really really horrible you know like we're going to destroy the sun is horrible, but like, we're going to make the, you know, we're going to like throw a rock into the sun that makes it 0.001% hotter. Like it's, and it's going to cost like $10 billion, billion, but that'll be us doing it. You'll know when it happens. Well, you won't know, but we'll tell you when it happens. Um, so I think, um, one of the things that I like best about uh, uh, reading your books in, and this book in particular uh, is how much you bring up, like you clearly go down the same weird rabbit holes of like, here's a thing you could do. Relatedly, uh, here's someone who tried something like it and the absolutely bizarre consequences. Um, I knew about high-speed trading and about how people tried to locate themselves uh, uh, you know, you want to locate, you want to locate your trading console at the right corner of the brokerage where you get a faster speed of light connection to the stock exchange. Right. Um, but I didn't actually, I didn't realize how uh, far people had taken that in terms of tunneling. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Uh, there's a company in the early 2000s called Spread Networks that in secret over, uh, I think three, maybe six months, uh, built a direct line between these two exchanges. And there were already direct lines, but they did reasonable things like follow roads and go around mountains. And they were like, we're going to go straight through mountains. We're going to take the most direct path we can. And if anyone asked, asked me, they had these rules. So if anyone asked around the sites to report them, it was built all in secret. So they did this big announcement saying, hey, we've we shaved, you know, five milliseconds off the quickest time for these exchanges, which means you can effectively see the future from everyone else. So you can make trades five milliseconds where anyone else does, which is basically guaranteed profit and became insanely rich almost literally overnight. And it's the crazy thing about it is that you describe it and it sounds, first it sounds like it shouldn't work. Then you say, okay, I see how this could work, but like surely we wouldn't permit this to work. <laughs> surely this would be stopped at some point, but uh, world, the American financial markets, I'll agree this is super cool and fine. So it's the one plot in the book where I can be like, if you need funding for your, for your evil schemes, this is legal and has been done before. <laughs> and uh, the, the way we, we make that to the level of super villainy is we don't, we go even more direct instead of uh, going around mountains or going through mountains, we, we take the direct route through the sphere of the earth. So we're digging a tunnel in a cord across that, that sphere shape, which shaves off more milliseconds. And uh, it's funny, I was giving a talk at a tech company and you could see the sort of light bulbs go off, but they're like, you know, maybe <laughs> there's no reason why we can't do this. And it would be nice to have an infinite sense, uh, source of fluid income. Huh. So it's, it was an unusual experience. 
I I liked um I've seen a couple of different discussions of of people digging tunnels um you know to to do a straight line between two places mm -hmm. uh and and that's that's always kind of cool because it's a very like direct way to see the earth being curved um and and you talked about uh in your scheme connecting i think the toronto stock exchange the new york one yeah which would mean a tunnel that goes about 12 was it uh six kilometers deep in the middle i think six kilometers deep i think yeah yeah um and people when they talk about these tunnels uh they talk about the that part in the middle where it has to be really 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 deep and but what i've always thought is really funny is the edges where, where it's your like a tunnel is like <laughs> it looks pretty much horizontal. Like it's just sloping down a little bit because like for the middle part, you're just tunneling through, you know, deep crystalline basement bedrock. But at the edges, you're going through like each successive person's basements. Um, and and I feel like like it's important. We should, you should either let people know you've got to start like three or four floors down just to avoid the awkwardness of negotiating with <laughs> Visual property holder. Um, I took a look at the the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. and figured out where the cord would run at what what depth. There's a shop right that you'd go under, but I think you'd be deep enough at that point that you'd you'd clear its basement storage facility. You would be in danger of running through the basement of the um, the there's a 9-11 Memorial Museum. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if you're going to start this from the stock exchange, you might want to go for like the Southern corner. That is uh, excellent advice. And I, I'd like to say that like I left little details out of the book so that I could keep all the super villainy for myself. But mm -hmm. I, I mapped it out too, but I didn't uh, think about the basement of the 9-11 Memorial. <laughs> Yeah. So normally I'd say, you know, you can, you can pay people, you can negotiate, um, but it's going to be hard yeah, to negotiate I... with the 9-11 Memorial to run a financial transaction tube through their site. <laughs> um, well, so I wanted to, uh, uh, with the number of like random weird facts you've come across. So I sent you a little bit of a heads up. Um, mm -hmm that I, I, had, I had started, I was like, okay, there are so many cool random good facts in here. And so I've assembled my own list of just, these are facts that I, in fact, exciting facts that I like. Right. And so I wanna see, I, 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 I wanna see if we can go back and forth a little bit. All right. Um, I feel like you did give me a heads up and I have a, a short list of sort of cool facts and mm -hmm. I'm excited for this. I feel like this is the uh, purest, form of geek conversation is just telling each other cool facts until one yeah, of us runs out of facts. This is like, for me, the, like the platonic ideal of a conversation. So it's just <laughs> telling cool facts. And at the end, we'll both know twice as many cool facts. Yeah, it's great. So, so stay on the theme here um, right. of the tunnel through the earth, I like the Large Hadron Collider produces neutrinos. And when they want to send those neutrinos to a laboratory, uh, on the other side of the earth. They just point, can just point the beam at the laboratory and the neutrinos go right through the earth to the laboratory. You don't need to worry about uh, the, the, the planet being in the way. That is super cool. Um, let me repay you for that cool fact with another cool fact. Um, <clears throat> in the book, I was looking up for uh, secret bases and owning your own country, uh, how much airspace and, and space beneath your house you own and there's this case, uh, United States versus Cosby, where there's this farmer who has these chickens and he lives next to an airfield and the army keeps landing these or flying these planes and landing them. And the noise as they buzz over his chicken coops is terrifying his chickens so much that they throw themselves up against the wall of their coop and break their necks and die. So he sues the US government saying, you can't fly over my house. And the Supreme Court, because all the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is like, we have never specified how much airspace you have. And so Farmer Cosby is like, clearly we have this medieval law that says he who owns land owns it all the way up to heaven and all the way down to hell. <laughs> and the mm -hmm. court's like, that doesn't sound like that's any place in the modern framework, but the US government is saying we own everything 
in the air, it's ours. And so the, that led to the consensus, the compromise now that uh, the airspace is yours up to, I believe 111 meters above the tallest building on your property. And so that came from a farmer with suicidal chickens who thought he owned the air up to heaven and the ground and hell. And I love that image because since the earth is rotating, it means like this, the stars directly above your house are always changing. You'd own a bit of this one planet for a fraction of a second throughout the lifetime of the universe. And I love that idea of, of like unknown, wildly inflated ownership. I, I, well, without giving too many spoilers here, I, I, I um, suspect you will enjoy my uh, upcoming book. Yes. <laughs> so, so um, let's see the, the, Cool fact. Yeah, cool fact. Um, so butterflies cross whole continents on migration mm -hmm. and they, they can stop to drink nectar. They do stop to drink nectar, but they don't need to. Um, they have enough fat reserves to do the entire flight. They're just incredibly efficient at soaring. That is a cool fact. I remember being a kid when they discovered where the monarchs go when they hibernate, because that was a mystery up to that point. Mm -hmm. And National Geographic had this cover of just like a place full of butterflies. And I was a kid and I was like, of course, the butterflies travel the continent and they find butterfly heaven. where they just It's just all these butterflies hanging out indefinitely. Um, my, re my response, cool fact, and this is, this is just an aside in the book, but I, my eyes bugged out when I was reading it, is um, there's a book called Regenesis by co-written by guy George Church. And just, he sort of goes off on this tangent where he's like, how many humans could the earth support? And normally when you ask that question, you just think about food and, and space and water. And he's like, no, 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 I just mean like matter wise, like you have this much carbon in a human and this much oxygen in a human. And if we just killed everything on earth and turned it into humans, how many humans could we have? And he worked about uh, 10 trillion. He was like, okay, but what if we start turning the earth itself? We start digging and turning the carbon in the earth into humans. How many humans can we make of the raw material of the earth? And he arrives at a uh, hundred quadrillion. And that's when we're devouring the earth to somehow turn that into humans. But then he worries that um, the sun doesn't put out enough energy for a hundred quadrillion humans. He's like, but my calculations, the most we can support with the sun is a mere 100 trillion. <laughs> And I was like, look, I don't know if there's a supervillain scheme here, but there's got to be something there. <laughs> just like transforming, mining the earth to transform it into just more humans in this, like, I guess that'd be the pink goo scenario, not like a, yeah, a gray I mean, goo, but there's like mad humans. Oh, weird. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like yeah, that. As soon as I said the phrase all. pink goo, I was like, I wish I hadn't said the phrase pink yeah. goo. And now it's right there floating <laughs> in our heads. Oh, but I mean, it's or, also sort of a, a paperclip machine. Because yeah. that's the idea that the super the the evil computer people use. You know, like they're talking about a super intelligence that just wants to turn everything into paper clips, and we say it as if it's this like horrible thing that could be introduced to the universe. But I guess humans are sort of paperclip machines for humans. <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's environmental restraints on us normally that prevent us from, like, no one. I don't think no one has seriously looked at can I dig a hole and turn that raw material into human. But if it was easier, I'm sure it would be done already. <laughs> um, I have some, uh, I have a cool Canada fact. Oh, please. Um, which is, I discovered this just browsing on Google Earth, which is how I discover a lot of weird stuff in the world. Um, right. Uh, which is the signpost forest. There's, there's a small town uh, somewhere up in the, the, the sort of uh, Great, Great Slave Lake region right. that is just uh, people have brought signs. And it's one of those things that started off where someone brought a couple of signs and had them set up in a yard or something in it. Uh, uh, and then people were like, oh, I'm going to add some signs to this. And now there's what they call the signpost forest. And it's just like signs as far as like you can walk through them. Um, and it is surreal looking. I love uh, that. That's like the the human vision, the human version of like the the classic ant algorithm, where if you if you see a piece of food, you pick it up. If you see a piece of food, you're carrying food, you drop it, and that pr produces piles, just naturally over time. 
this is human seeing a sign being like, I should bring another sign here. Yeah. And I like it because I, I saw the photo geotagged as like, this is in the middle of Canada, you know, in the, in, in the northern part where there are very few people. And it's a photo of just signs as far as the eye can see. And I'm like, OK, this is a mistake. Like this photo is mis geotagged or this isn't a real photo or something. And then I like I love when I, I'm like, OK, this isn't real. And then I look, and I'm like, I think there actually is a huge pile of signs in the middle of Canada. I love that. The closest I had to that was I was looking in Northern Ontario and I was like, are there lakes that don't have names? Can I name a lake? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Northern Ontario is full of lakes and there are tons of lakes that uh, there's no recorded, I'm sure they've been named at some point, but there's no recorded names for them. And, you know, as much as the romance of going somewhere that's off the map, there's still an echo of that in like going somewhere where the map is incomplete, where no one has slapped a name on these things. Uh, I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is overwhelming how many lakes there are in Canada. <laughs> I remember when, when someone discovered the, the world's largest island on a lake, on an island that's in a lake on an island, which yeah. is up in northern Canada. And they're like, it doesn't have a name. Nothing up there has you know <laughs> names as far as we can tell. I think someone yeah. finally added on Google Maps now, they added a name to it. Then they call it like Recursion Island or something. See, this is like, can you just name that? Who's the authority yeah, here? Yeah, I, I, I know, I know who. I it don't is want to be the there. authority. <laughs> well, um, I want to get to a couple of uh, questions. Yes. From you, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with I, uh, uh, I think my maybe my favorite fact that I know, um, which is from a research paper from a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which is that if you take a hamster wheel and you put it out in the woods on the ground, wild mice will come and run on it. Really. They've got videos, they've got footage. That feels like a mistake in reality. I know, right? <laughs> like I, someone didn't realize these two objects which weren't supposed to meet will interact in this way when they're developing the simulation. We thought we could just copy and paste the hamster code for forest mice and it would be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it because it's like the world, it's like we think we created this weirdness but actually the world is this weird and we're yeah, just kind of tapping in. into it the world is weird and we're just tapping into it like that so so okay i'm i'm gonna uh handle what are people wondering yeah a couple of these questions and and serena you can jump in if i'm uh doing something incorrectly here um uh <clears throat> So we, we had a, a question here. So, so isn't digging a hole and turning it into humans uh, just farming? <laughs> uh, Bill here who, who says, I'm, I'm now a little concerned about the agricultural industry. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I mean, at a high enough level and a long enough timeline, um, digging a hole and turning it into humans does sound like farming. Um, I don't have much of an answer for that, except for the fact that I once heard uh, graveyards described as skeleton farms. And I was like, that metaphor works really well because you have a little sign that tells you what's buried there. <laughs> so you've got the, the type of person, the name of the person. Um, but yes, that is an excellent observation, Bill. Um, so, so here's another question. Uh, I, I almost feel like we've touched on this a little bit. So how has being Canadian affected your attitudes towards super villainy? Because I feel like as an American, it's sort of assumed that like, if I gather enough power, I'm, you know, it's like, it's it's a normal part of the American dream is to try to just like become as successful and powerful as possible. And then that doesn't always go great. But yeah. Canadians, uh, how, how do you, how are you, how can you be a Canadian super villain? I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say because I've never been a Canadian, but if I had to guess, I'd say maybe my uh, willingness to sort of believe in this idea of enlightened supervillainy of someone who could be doing these wild outlandish charismatic schemes, uh, but for the greater good, uh, that strikes me as a, a stereotypical Canadian thing. Like we're, we'll take over the world, but we'll be nice about it. It'll be fine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, we've got a question here from Neville, which is, so henchmen, mm -hmm. the the book is the book has lots of great advice about how to take over the world, but 
henchmen seem like a classic component of uh, super villainy. Where do you get henchmen? What do you look for? And do you need like an HR department? How, how, does, uh, yeah. how does the aspiring supervillain approach uh, human resources? I got that into a bit of that when I talk about uh, building a secret base, because we end up, if you want a floating base at the bottom of the world in Antarctica, uh, you can build a base that needs a support staff of 80, but then you're, you're into these interpersonal HR type conflicts where like, how do we keep our hench people happy? And when you are isolated, uh, humans tend to get weird and sad and small things become big things. And then the great thing exploring that was we already did this experiment with the Biosphere 2 experiment in the 80s and 90s and saw how weird people can get and how in the space of two years, uh, personality conflicts become just like life or death, am I going to get murdered today stuff. So. Uh, yeah, you do need to select your support staff, your hench people, uh, for avoiding interpersonal conflict. And you may need to, at some point, fire them that if they don't work out. It, it's the standard problems you get when you have to manage large groups of humans. <laughs> it's kind of baked into our nature. I, I mean, if I could solve that problem quickly and easily, um, I'd be solving a lot of problems <laughs> quickly and easily. Um, so another another question here is uh, from Anonymous. Uh, so are are there any schemes that you wanted to include in the in the book or the pre order comic, and then and then had to reject <clears throat> for one reason or another? Like, do you have any? Yeah, there is one, and it was because it was not it was too simple. Uh, it was a classic scheme of I would like to throw my enemies into the sun. And the answer is, yeah, you, you can do that. In fact, the work's basically already been done by NASA with the Parker Solar Probe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can adjust its trajectory. It, it loops around planets to slow down and get closer and closer to the sun. You can pretty easily adjust that to go into the sun. The issue is that, you know, this is a four, five, six year trajectory. So it's not satisfying. It's really, I mean, revenge is a dish best served cold, but taking your enemy, putting them in a spaceship and launching them in the sun and being like six years later, having them impact the surface of the sun. It kind of feels like you forget you did it in the first place. Like, oh yeah, that revenge game, forgot about that. So it was the problem of like being too easy on one hand, but also like not, it didn't point to a lot of other interesting problems and, and, and plots and quests like the other schemes in the book did. So it became sort of like, oh, I, I'm. This is surprisingly and disappointingly easy to throw your enemies into the sun. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different problems that people are like. Could we solve that by throwing something in? Like everyone's always like, hey, why don't we deal with nuclear waste by throwing yeah. it into the sun? And and um, it always sounds appealing, like when you say it. Yeah, and <laughs> if like if the waste happen. was already there on, near the surface of the sun, then sure. Yeah. But, but um, getting it there is the thing. Let's load all our nuclear waste into rockets that explode one percent of the time, and then launch it over our continent. Uh, um, did you did you know? Um, I think I I might be wrong about this. To my knowledge, your country is the only one that has had a functioning nuclear reactor thrown at it. Explain. <laughs> uh, there was a there was a Soviet nuclear powered reconnaissance satellite which uh, had a reactor on board for, mm -hmm. for power and it lost control and re-entered the atmosphere over Canada. Um, Did not know that. Possibly crossing right over the signpost forest, possibly. <laughs> it was about the same region. Um, and uh, and it, uh, there, there was a lengthy like who pays for the cleanup where Canada was demanding the Soviet Union come and play for it. And, uh, yeah, sure. I forget how that got resolved, but, but yeah. It's probably fine probably fine. Um, that won't happen with the one we're launching to the sun. Yeah, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't What could possibly go wrong? Um, I actually, I have a follow-up question to something I asked earlier, uh, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so we talked about, you know, running that algorithm in reverse and realizing, hey, we can use this drug discovery thing to figure out the worst drugs. Uh, yeah. And that's actually super toxic. So you've got a whole list of plans here, though, that, that produce bad outcomes <laughs> like here's a thing you can use to 
make the world really bad, at least from you know the point of view of the reader, even if the villain thinks it will help. Right. Um, so are any of these schemes things that you can take this same stuff and run it in reverse and make the world uh, better? Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> the chapter about de-extinction where we talk about ways to bring back dinosaurs and that leads into like bringing back passenger pigeon and woolly mammoth and animals like that. Um, I think, I think that would be good for the world. Um, there's issues in that like animals don't exist in a vacuum and the environment that supported the woolly mammoth no longer exists and passenger pigeons, we think probably were these huge, like maybe there were only five swarms across all of North America and there'd be these huge swarms of animals that would roost for three days and just obliterate the ground underneath them with, with pigeon poop. And so like these are, there's clearly downsides there and there's probably Jurassic Park style unexpected consequences of bringing back extinct animals and not putting them in a zoo. If, they, if they're in a zoo, it's fine. Um, but at least in the case of dinosaurs, I feel like the interest you get just from the science communication level uh, mm. probably makes it worth it for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the most popular what if questions was, um... Uh, has that I've never answered uh, has been <laughs> if you what if someone reintroduced you know allosaurs into mm -hmm. the modern you know some modern uh, you know savanna or rainforest or the plains of North America or wherever um, would they dominate the ecosystem or not and and that sounded like a fun question and I was like ready to like go talk to some wildlife people and stuff and then like as I tried to start researching it it very quickly became clear like the limiting factor for these animals is us like yeah. the reason you know the the thing like the the answer the sort of depressing answer to that question is like they would be limited by the same thing limiting other large carnivores which is that people would really want to shoot them and then they would all get shot unless we managed to stop that so it's like yeah. it's sort of up to us um and it's like uh uh whenever like i i'm 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 i i have complicated feelings about the jurassic park uh <laughs> franchise which is a theme we've come back to a couple of times here mm -hmm. but um you know i've got a lot i've got a i've got a, a lot of opinions there but um but jurassic world dominion the thing like dinosaurs have gotten out will the rest of humans be okay uh i still it's like have you seen what happens when an animal gets out somewhere where it's not supposed to be <laughs> like one of my trying friends to take saying, care of it pretty quick yeah one of my friends was saying that it, it'll be great if the movie is like five minutes long and it's like oh they all got hit by cars <laughs> like well that that solved itself yeah yeah um, it's it's like when a, you, no one really remembers how big a moose is until they see a moose inside of the road and they're like oh i had that exact experience with horses mm -hmm. where i had forgotten i guess how big horses are and i'm i'm a tall guy i'm two meters tall and i went with uh my wife jen she rides horses we went to the stables and they called her horse across the field not her horse, but a horse she knew when she was a girl. Long story. Anyway, the horse is running across the field. I remember staring at the horse and being like, something is wrong. Either it's further away or closer than it seems, or like my eyes don't, aren't making sense of this. And this horse comes, he's bigger than me. And I'm not used to animals being bigger than me. And this horse, when he liked you, would headbutt you. And I wasn't expecting it. So the horse just comes up to me and then knocks me with his head. I'm lying on my ground, looking up at this horse. <laughs> and being like, wow, I, I, I guess I thought I'd to see a big dog and there is now an animal that is bigger than me that has knocked me to the ground and I did not realize horses were that big. I was at a farm a few days ago and had the same experience with pigs that they had there Yeah, that I did not realize. Uh, I imagined them because you know you see like cute cartoon pigs. Piglets. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> yeah piglets they're like like Wilbur in Charlotte's Web seemed fairly small, you know, mm -hmm. hang, hung out with a spider. <laughs> They're probably about the same size, right? Um, but yeah, some animals are extremely large. One of my fun, one fun. of my, one of the facts on my fact list, I have been meaning to confirm this for years because there's only one source and it's a guy who retired recently in Alaska, um, that moose can dive up to 20 feet while foraging for food. Uh, under wow. Yeah. Moose definitely like swim and dive. Um, and when you're as big as a moose, 20 feet is not that far. But uh, 
it's still hard to prove. Honestly, uh, I feel like if I walked into the woods and saw a moose on its like hind legs walking around, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> You're too powerful. So let me see. I think I think we have time for um for for one more question. All right. Um, this is a a small but uh, crucial question. Uh, several people have asked it, including our friend Gretchen. Oh, um, hi Gretchen. Hey Gretchen McCulloch. Um, <clears throat> so if uh, uh, but the the question here is, so a toast sandwich, do you yes. butter it? What's the recipe? Okay, so there's different recipes. The one I did, which I stand by, is I put uh, salted butter on one side. Some people will not butter it, which I thought made it a little dry. Uh, you can also salt and pepper if you want. I think pepper is a bit gilding the lily and you wanna focus on the subtle nuances of flavor. So it's a piece of uh, bread, a piece of butter toast and a piece of bread. And there's also the reverse toast sandwich, which of course is toast bread toast. And you know- That's, that's that a has... grilled bread sandwich. <laughs> that's I guess a bread yeah, panini. There's also like the open-faced toast sandwich, which is just bread toast. I, um, there's, I've never liked the open-faced sandwich that they can just tack the word sandwich on at the end. <laughs> I mean, the internet has lost yeah. many great minds to what is a sandwich. And the legal system. Um, this is another one from my fun fact list. <laughs> there, there was a, a court case here in the Boston area uh, over, I, I forget the restaurants, um, a restaurant had a lease on a location in a shopping mall, right. a shopping plaza. And I think it was a Panera or, or some similar san a, sand a place that did a lot of sandwiches. And their lease agreement said, we won't put any other restaurants in the shopping mall that serve sandwiches. So sure. you, can, you can get this lease and you don't have to worry that there'll be competition next door. Um, and then a burrito place moved in. Amazing. And the first place was like, <laughs> that's basically a sandwich place. Burritos are basically sandwiches. And um, and uh, then the, it went to court. And the court, the, like there's a judge ruling on whether the burrito, whether a burrito counts as a sandwich or not. Uh, and wow. They, I believe they ruled that it did not. So that's the place got to stay. That's amazing. There's a ruling, I think, in America, in your country. Mm -hmm. um, there was a rule, a dispute along around the lines of like importing dolls versus action figures. And the X-Men got involved and were the X-Men heroes, superheroes or not, because that defined, that had some legal impact. And so I forget which way it went, whether or not the X-Men were legally superheroes or not, but that like ties into the X-Men mythos of like, are they heroes or are they hated and feared? And I love that the uh, legal system had to make a ruling on that. <laughs> is Wolverine a good guy? Is he a superhero? We now have a court ruling to point to. Oh man, I love that. Okay. From toast sandwiches yes. to the X-Men. Well, I mean, I think that that covers the spectrum of human experience. <laughs> okay, well, I think, so. uh, I think, I think we've run out of time. Um, but this has been so much fun. This is great. Um, it's, it's, I really miss uh, seeing people. I think we all miss seeing people, but uh, getting to hang out and exchange cool facts was great. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I want. Thank you both. This was just delightful in every way. Um, I was grinning the whole time. Um, and yeah, pigs and horses are really, really, really big. They're really big. <laughs> Much bigger Nobody tells you there. until you, you see the bigger the horse and you're like, oh no. Yeah, they I've really, made a mistake. The first yeah. time I saw a praying mantis, until that moment, I assumed they were the size of crickets or something. Are they not that the size was a of crickets? Terrifying moment. They are not. Oh, they are not. <laughs> they are much bigger than you think an insect outside of a nature documentary is going to be. But like smaller than a horse. <laughs> smaller than a horse, yeah. Significantly smaller than a horse, but not as much smaller than your hand as you would expect. Let me put it that way. Yeah. They're not I'm as big as your hand. But they're, they're not they're not that big, but they're they're sizable. They they have a little bigger hat. than you think. 
Yeah. 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 I had a friend who had um, praying mantis pets that sort of free roamed in her house. Um, and occasionally they would drop off the ceiling onto your, onto your, onto you basically um, onto the dinner table on. Um, yeah. And it, it oh. had, it had some weight when that would happen. Uh, how is your friend doing? <laughs> <laughs> She's fine. <laughs> They they just um, to hear it. yeah they're 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 they they have personalities. <laughs> uh, anyway, wonderful to have you both. This was really great. Thank you both for being here. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for spending yes. your time with us. Um, we had so many great questions. I'm glad we got to answer a few of them. Um, it's just always wonderful to see engagement and to see and to see all of you. Um, if, if you asked one, I didn't get to it and you're like burning to an answer, you can drop me an email or hit me up on Twitter. Um, and I will absolutely answer your questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, please check out Ryan's book on harvard.com and keep an eye out for What If 2, which is coming in September as well. Um, I did for that. And keep reading. Stay villainous and be well. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>